<laughs> ah, sorry. Hello, everyone. How's it going? <laughs> Apologies if I'm sniffing a bit. Got a bit of hay fever today. Oh, hey Judge, you got a new uh, new YouTube handle. Ah. Oh. Yeah, cheer. Cool. Hey, uh, how's it going? Good to see some familiar fa faces. <laughs> yeah, I, I bet you do. <laughs> hey, Abby. Hi, hi, Cleo. Hi, Limbo. Uh, cool. Set up stuff. Hey Sammy, how's it going? Are you just mad keen to learn about the properties of radiation today? <laughs> I guess uh choose yeah, I mean a seven banging mark. <laughs> Hey, Lil, how's it going? B, I guess, yeah. Dress, dress for the, dress for the job you want. <laughs> hey, Veronica. How's it going? Good to see some old and new faces here. Who's new? Nice, good to see. You. Have you done any snap provides before? <laughs> yeah, I think <laughs> I think you might. <laughs> Flaunt it, I guess. Yeah, we've been doing quite a lot of these home study clubs recently. They've been really fun, actually. That's one way to gain subs. <laughs> yeah, I mean, maybe we should call ourselves grade nine in GCSE chemistry. That'd be a good advert. Uh. Yeah, okay. Uh, so, yeah, I'm going to wait another minute till we kick off the actual session. So, sure. Um, do you know the formula for momentum? <laughs> Here equals MV. Good. So, momentum is like a measure of how hard it is to stop something. Because uh, if something's kind of coming towards you and you need to stop it, it's harder to do that if it's moving faster towards you. And it's also harder to do that if it's heavier. It's like how much, how hard is it to stop something? That's, that's, that's what the momentum is. <laughs> yeah uh, it's weird five years ago for us it was a star through to um i think f or g for gcse as well as a level uh so it's changed now that's grade one to nine which took a while to figure out how to teach and it took a while to figure out if you think someone's on track or doing well but yeah Cool, okay, let's do this. So. 
today is about properties of radiation. So in general, in these A-level physics sessions, we've been doing a lot of work on particle physics, etc. And so this is kind of a continuation of this. We're chatting about radiation and we're chatting about particles. Good. Okay. So um, at the end of today, there's going to be a coupon code, which you can all use for a discount on Snaprovice. Um, so this, as, as you can see, this coming today is from Snaprovice. We're really enjoying doing these uh, online, these YouTube sessions. We've been, been getting really good feedback, uh, but we're doing a load more of these on our website as well. Uh, so yeah, stay tuned for a discount. Great. Okay, so let's slam in and have a go at a question. And this is question C of some question somewhere at some time that happened at some point. An isotope of carbon-15 decays into an isotope of nitrogen. Complete the nuclear reaction below. Okay, so what can people tell me? What's the rule for how to balance nuclear equations? How do I balance nuclear equations? Does anyone know? Ah, nice. I see we're converging on some answers here. Good. So whenever you see an equation like this, a nuclear reaction equation with one of these arrows in the middle, the instruction is the following. Get the numbers to balance on the top. Get the numbers to add up to the same thing on the left and right hand side of the arrow and the same on the bottom, on these bottom numbers. So for the top numbers, I have a 15 here. Okay, great. I have a zero here and they've not said anything here. And we actually happen to know already uh, from previous sessions that these neutrino things also have uh, these numbers being zero. What are these numbers, by the way? Now, if this is zero and this is zero and the number on the right hand side has got to be the same as the number on the left hand side, this also needs to be 15. Then the top numbers will balance. Okay, yeah, so these are two different types of number, aren't they? This one is called the mass number. What does it measure usually? Yeah, and the other one is the atomic number, absolutely right. Good, the mass number is like the number of protons plus the number of neutrons in the nucleus. What's the atomic number? Yeah, the atomic number is just kind of the number of protons, but it's a bit more than that. Number of protons slash charge. Because here we're being shown an electron with an atomic number of minus one. So this number on the bottom is kind of like atomic number or like charge. Either way, we've got to get it to balance. What number do we have to put here for it to balance? On the left-hand side, we have a six. On the right-hand side, we have a blank and a minus one. Good, so this must be a seven. Then we have seven minus one plus zero is the same as six. Really good stuff, well done. Use the quark model to state the changes taking place within the nucleus of the carbon-15 atom. Okay. So does anyone recognize what type of decay this is? This is a very particular type of radioactive decay. Yeah, first of all, what's kind of happened inside here? We've got the same number of protons and neutrons, but we've got one more proton than we had before. So we must have one less 
We must have one less. Uh, beta minus decay. Yeah, this is a beta minus decay. Absolutely right. Um, and what's actually happened here is, well, if the number of protons and neutrons has stayed the same, but the number of protons has gone up by one, we must have lost a neutron. So first of all, for our own working, what's happened here? A neutron has become a proton, and then there's all this other stuff. A neutron became a proton. So what's the quark decomposition of a neutron? And what's the quark decomposition of a proton? Okay, so a neutron is up, down, down. And a proton is down, down, up. Absolutely right. Ah, sorry, not down, down, up. Up, up, down. There we go. So if a neutron becomes a proton, what has to happen with the quarks? Yeah, we've had a down quark become an up quark. Absolutely right. Good. So that's what they're looking for here. They want to know that a down quark comes to an up quark. Actually just stating up, up, down becomes up, up, down, down becomes up, up, down would have also been sufficient for the mark. Good. Okay, next question. The isotope of uranium, U238-92, decays into a stable isotope of lead, 206-AT2, by means of a series of alpha and beta decays. In this series of decays, alpha decay occurs eight times and beta decay occurs n times. Calculate n. Okay, so first of all, uh, COM14, I guess, is the, is the highest, like, at all commonly seen isotope. I suspect carbon-15 can just about exist, uh, but you might... Uh, my chemistry is not so amazing. Yeah, yeah, so let's take a look. Let's take a look at this question. First of all, we're told that alpha decay occurs eight times. Should we see what happens to uranium when we decay it eight times? Oh, well done, Takir. Fantastic. Well done. Good, okay, so in an alpha decay, what happens? What happens to the top number? And what happens to the bottom number? What happens, what is a uh, <laughs> physics never ends? Good. An alpha decay is like get, getting rid of a helium nucleus. So it's getting rid of four particles all in all, two of them protons and two of the neutrons. So if I give away two protons, I go down to 90. And if I give away two protons and I'm giving away two neutrons, my mass has gone down by four. So this would have gone down to two, three, four. Now we don't want to keep doing this because we've got to do this eight times to figure out where we get to after eight alpha decays. So I suggest we notice now that each time we do an alpha decay, this goes down by four. Each time we do an alpha decay here, this goes down by two. All in all, if we do it eight times then, well, eight times four tells us the number of the number that will go down by on the top. And what's eight times four? Genuinely, can I remember what eight times four is? 24, 32, yeah. We're gonna lose 32 particles altogether. How many are gonna be protons? Half of them will be, 16. So if we lose eight alpha particles, we're losing 32 protons and neutrons, 16 of which are protons. Good. Okay. 
So we know that after these eight decays, two, three, eight, 92, we're going to end up at what? Well, 92 minus 16, that's equal to 76. And there's going to be something up here. Um, in fact, we can figure it out. 238, that goes to 202. Okay. Uh, what have I done wrong there? Something's up there. 206, 32. Yes, that is indeed 206. I went a little mad for a second. Good. Okay. So now we want to find out the number of beta decays from here that would take us to 82. So I think some of you have already found the answer here. Each of these beta decays adds in a proton. We saw this before in the previous section. Each beta decay took us from, for example, six to seven here, a neutron to a proton. Now we want to keep this number constant and we want to keep adding numbers here. So you're absolutely right. If we do six beta minus decays, then we'll go from 72 or 76 all the way up to 82. Good. So you're absolutely right. Six is the answer here. Six is the number of beta minus decays that we need to do. Good. Okay. In a short period at the end of the 19th century, four radiations emitted by solid matter were discovered. Alpha, beta, gamma, and x-rays. Okay, state and explain two differences between alpha and beta radiation. So let me know what you think. There's a few choices you could have here. What do you reckon? Some differences between alpha and beta radiation. Okay, so beta has a low wavelength, high frequency. Alpha is a helium nucleus. Beta is a high speed electron. Okay, cool. What about how far they can get in air? Does anyone know about this? Aha, uh -huh. yeah. Good. Alpha is more ionizing but can't travel as far in air. Alpha is short range and highly ionizing. Alpha about five centimeters in air. Beta has a longer penetration depth. Okay, cool. There's some nice answers in here. I'm liking these. Alpha is stopped by paper. Beta is stopped by aluminum. Good. Sorry. Okay. So what should we go for? Well, um, First of all, there's actually the charge. Here's one simple answer. Alpha has charge of plus two. Beta typically has charge of plus or minus one, depending on whether it's plus or minus uh, beta decay. Good. Yeah, I really like these answers too about how far they can get. So I, how about ionization? Alpha is more heavily ionizing than beta. Cool. Penetration depth. This is how far can something get? Penetration depth. Okay. So it depends. There's two types of beta decay. Sometimes an electron is emitted. If an electron is emitted, we call it minus decay because an electron has a negative charge. Um, on the other hand, sometimes you have the opposite version where what's called a positron is emitted. A positron is like a kind of an opposite or an anti-electron. 
and that thing has a positive charge. Cool. Okay. So, good. Um, in terms of penetration depth, um, beta can travel further than alpha in air. Um, alpha is stopped by paper, beta by aluminium sheet. Now they're only asking for two. So we've absolutely, we've gone above and beyond what we need here. Can beta be positive? Absolutely right, so beta can be positive. Um, there's two types of beta decay. You have a proton going to a neutron plus a positron, and you can have a neutron going into a proton plus an electron. So. Essentially, you need to choose the right one of these to get the charges to balance. Here, there's a charge of plus one. Here, there's no charge. So here, there needs to be a charge of plus one. Here, there's a charge of zero. Here's the, here, there's a charge of plus one. So this needs to be a charge of minus one for things to be balancing. Ah, oh, lovely, awesome. Uh, sorry, I don't have the mark scheme to hand right now. Apologies for that. Cool. Okay. So those are some those are some nice differences that we've been able to state. Plus two charge for an alpha particle. Oh yeah, good question. Okay, so what is an alpha particle made of? What's an alpha particle made of? Well, an alpha particle is made of two protons and two neutrons. Now, do the neutrons have any charge? No. They don't. Do the protons have charge? Yes, each one has plus one. So altogether, this particle has a charge of plus two. Good, absolutely right, well done. Okay, no worries. State which type of radiation, alpha, beta, or gamma, produces the greatest number of iron pairs per millimeter in air? Now that's a funnily phrased question. So, you have to try and figure out what you think they mean in terms of the normal words you'd use by producing the greatest number of iron pairs. Uh, no, an alpha particle doesn't have an electrons. Good question. Double positive at in the helium is alpha particle. Yeah. Um, although we would call it an ion rather than atom precisely because it's charged. Good, okay, so which of these types produces the greatest number of iron pairs? Feel free to say what, what word you think they mean by this as well, producing a number of iron pairs. Yeah, so this is indeed alpha. Why? Because producing a, no a load of iron pairs in air, that's what, that's what ionizing means, yeah. Ionizing is when I have, okay, so here's my air and I have my alpha particle moving through it, and it knocks electrons off of things, just knocks electrons off of the atoms that are in here, um, turning them into ions, producing an ion pair. So um, you're absolutely right, the answer here is alpha. Good, which one could be used to test for cracks in metal pipes? So the iron pair is just the pair of the iron itself along with the electron that's been knocked off. It's a strange phrasing. Um, mm. So these metal pipes are typically, this is quite an interesting question, this one. The setup for one of these metal pipe tests is the following. You can't see the metal pipe. You, you know, if you could see the metal pipe, then you'd be able to see the crack yourself. So the reason you're having to do anything else is because the pipe itself is underground. Something like this, or it's behind some surface. Now, typically, do we think 
that beta radiation will be able to get through the ground to the earth where we're standing here with some kind of a detector. So beta won't be able to, yeah, so the problem here is actually that beta won't be able to get through the ground. So we'll never detect it as we're walking along the ground here. The idea with gamma is the following. If there's a crack in this pipe and we put in some gamma source, then we're trying to find this crack, this leak. And the point is that all the fluid, including the, st the stuff that we've put radioactive stuff into, is going to get to the crack and then leak out. As a result, the radiation that we can read is going to greatly drop off from here to here. If we move over here, we're not going to, there's no radiation because all of it leaked out at this point here. So the whole point is we want some kind of radiation that will get through the ground. Yeah, we want something that can pass through the soil. Absolutely right. And so our choice here is gamma. I think beta is a sensible idea because you kind of, there's this idea of it's something to do with a metal pipe and beta can get through metal pipe, can't get through metal pipe, but can get through the rest. So the reason beta would be a problem for this kind of setup, when they're asking whether we can test for cracks in metal pipes, they mean, they mean in particular in this situation where you can't see the metal pipe because it's buried, for example, underground. And beta is no use here because beta will never get through the ground. And so whether I'm here, 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 or here, I will never detect any beta radiation. Yeah. So depending on where I am along, along the ground here, I would never detect any beta radiation. So putting beta radiation into this pipe has no use to me because I will never detect it. I want to detect a leak by detecting the place where the fluid is, is escaping the pipe. So because there's no fluid here, I won't be reading any radio. So let's say I put gamma radiation into the fluid. Then on this side of the pipe over here, before the crack, there's radiation, there's gamma radiation coming from the pipe because it's in the fluid and that reaches me. It leaks out of the pipe. So there's nothing in the pipe here. As a result, I don't read any radiation coming through here because all the gamma stuff is over here now. So the idea is that we just need something that can pass through the soil that we can sense. Good, okay. So, and our answer there is then gamma. No worries. Okay. Specific radioisotope sources are chosen for tracing the passage of particular substances through the human body. Why is a gamma emitting source commonly used? No worries. So, mm, good. Good, there's two, there's two reasons you could go for here to earn your mark. Why would I use gamma emitting source inside a human body? First of all, again, just like with the ground thing, we need to choose a source of radiation that we can actually sense from the outside. So that would get rid of alpha straight away. Because out, you put alpha inside the body, it's not gonna get outside the body. You're not gonna sense anything. So one good reason for using gamma is that it can actually pass through the body. And pass through body to be detected. Now gamma and beta are often used in this kind of medical situation, precisely because they both are able to pass through the body. Can you think of any reason why it's better to use gamma if you can than beta?
so it's true that gamma is is used to treat cancer but it won't this this is a very specific question about tracing this is actually something where you're trying to diagnose a problem in a human rather than treat it good so ionizing as well radiation does cause damage usually your body is able to recover from this kind of damage depending on how much of the damage there is but you want to do the least amount of damage possible to your body um so yeah low ionization i think those are some nice answers here less ionizing means less damage absolutely right good um yes i think if you haven't mentioned that it's the body it's got to be passed through then yeah it's less clear whether you understand why it's being used specifically in this situation so i would very much put the context using the word body here yeah um okay state why the source should not have a very short half-life okay so let's let's think a bit more about about what's happening here we've got a human a human what am i a robot okay we've got a human and we've put something we've asked them to for example ingest something that we can trace as it moves around the body and this thing is going to be emitting radiation that we're going to be detecting okay why shouldn't it have a short half-life yeah it will become half-life is how quickly the radioactivity decays so if it's got a short half-life it will decay too quickly for us to detect as it moves around the body good okay why shouldn't it have a too, too long of a half-life let's call it a human I'm doing too much computer science and not enough talking to real people at the moment yeah why is it dangerous yeah or in particular whatever whatever rate of decay it has whatever if it has a long half-life it's just going to be causing damage for a long time so if it has a okay we don't want it to have a long half-life and this is so that it doesn't cause damage to body for long time period. Good. Absolutely right. These mutations would then also themselves cause damage. Good. Okay. Ionization smoke detectors contain a small amount of the radioactive isotope Amer I can never pronounce this americium americium okay 241 am is an alpha emitter it has a half life of 432 years and the activity from the source in a new smoke detector is around 3.5 times 10 to the 4 baccarels Okay. Explain why radiation produced by a smoke detector does not produce a health hazard. So an ionization smoke detector contains a small amount of some radioactive isotope. It's an alpha alpha emitter. Yeah, so it's about it's about being an alpha emitter. So Why, why is it 
why being an alpha emitter why is that good can only pass through a couple of centimeters of air nice good so if i'm stood around here and there's a smoke detector up here the alpha radiation can't get any further than this so we're pretty safe not only that but it's inside a plastic container as well and it definitely can't get through a plastic container good so alpha radiation is stopped by either the plastic or Good. Either of those would have been good for the mark. Good. Alpha, alpha cannot penetrate very far, only a few centimeters. Good. Okay, now we're jumping straight from A to C. C. An ionization smoke detector is sold with the guarantee that it lasts a long lifetime. Comment on the appropriateness of this guarantee based on its use of americium. I think that's how you pronounce it. Two, four, one. What do you reckon? So, do you think it lasts a lifetime? It has a large atomic mass, it has a long half life. Good. So, the big deal here is that clearly the kind of thing that's being used is the fact that this thing is radioactive. Now, the half-life tells me how long it will take for the radioactivity, the, the kind of the count of radiation it's producing to go down by half. So it looks here, if in 432 years it goes down by half, then in a lifetime, which is maybe what, let's say, let's say roughly, off. to the nearest hundred it's 100 years then yeah it's not even going to go down by half yeah so long half life radioactivity goes down slowly Not even half, not even by half in 100 years. Um, the, the guarantee is appropriate. Good. Ah, okay, cool. Um, what's, uh, what are you thinking? So they're, they're not looking for anything. They're not looking for any particularly big calculations. They're just looking for a reference to the fact to whether it really is a long, a long time that this smoke detector will last. And this smoke detector is gonna keep on working for a long time because the amount of radiation it's producing isn't gonna go down by much in a hundred years. So they're saying it lasts a lifetime and we have to say whether we think it lasts a lifetime. Now, you can give different answers to this as long as you kind of back it up. You could say that you think the amount it's going to go down by in 100 years is actually quite a bit. But it looks to me, in my opinion, and I can back it up, is to say, well, it goes down by a half in 400 years. So it doesn't go down by much at all in 100 years. Uh, and so my answer is, yeah, it's an appropriate guarantee. It will last for my lifetime. My lifetime is maybe 100 years and it won't go down by too much. So it will keep working. 
Cool. Okay. No worries. A particularly, a, a particular, a particular nucleide is described as proton rich. Describe, discuss two ways in which the nucleide, nucleide may decay. You'll be awarded marks for the quality of written communication in your answer. Hmm. So beta minus or alpha. So what do we reckon? Beta plus or beta minus? Are we trying to get rid of charge or are we trying to gain charge? Yeah, we've, we've got too many neutrons. We've got too many, sorry, not too many neutrons. We've got too many protons. It's proton rich. Well, if we've got too many protons, we should try and get rid of some of them. So what's the one we're looking for? We're looking for proton to neutron. And proton to neutron, that will be a positron here, not an electron. So this is a beta plus decay that we want. Okay. So we've got to discuss two ways. One of the ways is by beta plus decay, some excess protons are turned into neutrons. Good. So I also like this alpha answer. Um, you're absolutely right. Another answer is electron capture for the same reason. So beta plus decay would work. Electron capture is correct for the same reasons. Um, so I won't write them out again because I would have just written the same thing. There's another option as well, which someone mentioned, I think. The final option is alpha decay. Alpha decay. Now we've got two Would you describe what's electron capture? Yeah, absolutely. So we've got too many protons. Each proton, sorry, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> oh dear. Oh, I think that's the, the last one. Okay, an electron capture, it's a bit like a beta decay, but the electron comes in rather than being sent out. Thank you very much. <laughs> So the proton takes an electron, whoa, wrong side, and turns into a neutron. Again, and there's some kind of a neutrino here. I can't actually remember which one off the top of my head. Now, the proton has a charge of plus one, the electron has a charge of minus one, neutron has a charge of zero. So yes, this, this equation balances out. How does it happen? Now, that's a good question. I don't know if I can answer that. Essentially, it happens, it happens because it would make the atom more stable. So if there are any electrons around, this atom would love to use that electron to get rid of its one of its protons. Um, in terms of exactly how it happens, great question. I'm not sure I could say too much on it. Okay, now, uh, what else do you want to say? Yeah, good. So a final thing we can do is produce alpha decay. So alpha decay um, will also, um, and this is, this is a kind of general fact that, uh, that it's, good to, it's good to know and to be able to recall. Is so that alpha decay for something proton rich, something with too many protons, will 
will bring nucleus closer to being stable. So yeah, alpha decay is good for anything proton rich. <laughs> okay. Um, let's have a go at another question. 1C, explain why sources of beta radiation often also produce gamma rays of discrete frequencies. You may be awarded additional marks to those shown in the brackets for the quality written communication. Okay, so I, I think this is quite a cool question. It's something that doesn't get asked that often. Hmm. Okay, yeah, so first of all, forget the discrete bit. We'll come to discrete. Why is it that after a beta radiation, we also produce some gamma? So let's say I have some, let's say I have some, I mean, this wouldn't really happen for such a small nucleus, but let's imagine I had a proton. Let's imagine I had two protons actually, and, and one of them decayed. So it became a proton and a neutron. So this would happen by some kind of, what's it got to give out here? Um, a positron, I guess, plus some other stuff. Now, there's something interesting about these nuclei here that we haven't talked about much, and it doesn't come up much, but absolutely can be asked about. You know that electrons in atoms can exist in excited states. They have discrete energies available to them. Now, the same is true for a nucleus. So, first of all, um, a nucleus... has discrete energy levels it can occupy. There are discrete energies that a nucleus can actually have. So there could be energy one for the nucleus, energy two for the nucleus, energy three for the nucleus. Usually you see this sort of thing drawn for electrons, but it's absolutely possible for the nucleus itself to have some different energies. Now, when these two protons decay into a proton and a neutron, they don't necessarily decay into the lowest possible energy level. Now, just like as excited electrons, this is an excited nucleus, and, ex and an excited nucleus can drop down to its lowest energy level to emit some new energy. Yes, it is. It's, it's a difficult question if you haven't seen this bit before. Um, once you've seen it once, essentially the takeaway is just like what you know for electrons in energy levels, the nucleus itself can have energy levels. A nucleus has discrete energy levels it can occupy. After beta plus radiation, after beta plus decay, let's call it that. After beta plus decay, the nucleus can be in an excited energy level. <coughs> Sorry. It can be in an excited A level, energy level. And so can drop down. So can drop down to emit a specific 
frequency photon. Uh, they turn out all to be of kind of gamma. <laughs> Thank you. They turn to be all of about gamma frequency, but discrete frequencies inside there because there's discrete energy levels. So yeah, this is a this is quite an interesting, quite an unusual question if you haven't seen this before. Um, so the answer is, after beta radiation, there can be some excess energy, and that excess energy will be released as gamma. Not only that, but the excess energy that you have, if you have excess energy, it's because you're in some excited energy level, and those are discrete. So you can only be in one of these particular ones, and there's only certain frequencies you'll be able to emit by moving to the ground. An atom has one nucleus that has many energy states it could be in, just like an atom has one electron that can be in many different energy levels. We don't usually talk about it, but the nucleus also has energy levels available to it. Yeah. No worries. Okay. In September 1987, two youngsters in Brazil removed a stainless steel cylinder from a machine in an abandoned clinic. Five days later, they stole the cylinder to a scrap dealer who prized open a platinum capsule inside to reveal a glowing blue a glowing blue powder the powder was found to contain cesium 137 with a high activity 5.2 times 10 to the 13 uh, okay it's a beta minus emitter with a half-life of 30 years discuss the dangers to the youngsters of possessing this cylinder for five days uh yes it is in the spec yeah So, what can we say? What do we reckon? Was there much danger to the youngsters in possessing the cylinder for five days? They've been carrying around a beta minus emitter. Could this be causing any damage? Is there any reason why it wouldn't cause as much damage? Yes. Yeah, so. We can first of all say that radiation can damage human cells by ionizing them. Is there any reason why they might have gotten away with it here? It's still radioactive. Ah, so the half-life is the half-life is long, and this is kind of interesting because half-life that just means that basically it never dropped off in radioactivity while while they were holding it. It still stayed at that kind of highly radioactive rate. Yeah, so I'm liking this idea about the metal. It was in a stainless steel cylinder. Beta minus radiation can't pass easily through thin sheets of metal. The youngsters, <laughs> I wonder how old a youngster is. The youngsters will have been partly protected by the metal cylinder. <laughs> yeah, so the metal was blocking this radiation. Yeah, I'm going to assume 16, I'm not sure. 
two youngsters. Good. Okay, so that's our that's our answer. We have those three marks. So we should mention that yes, they will have been exposed to some radiation, and some radiation will cause them some damage. But the good news is it was inside this stainless st steel cylinder. Um, and that stuff um, will stop the beta radiation from being able to reach them very easily. Fantastic. Okay, well done, everyone. Um, that was a really good session and uh, really good engagement, really good answers. Um, it's really good when everyone's kind of voting on the answers because it helps me to see how you're doing. Oh, no worries. Thank you so much for coming. That also helps. <laughs> Yeah, I reckon the youngsters, I mean, I can't tell you, I, I kind of don't want to look up the story now, just in case. <laughs> so in my head, they lived. So <laughs> as long as you can back up your opinion, it's fine in the exam. So <laughs> hopefully, hopefully I'm right. <laughs> no worries. Thank you. Uh, so um, I will be able to give everyone a coupon as well. Uh, but I'd first of all like to quickly give everyone a walkthrough of Snap Revise. So Snap Revise is where we do all of these kind of web classes usually. Yeah, they're probably not youngsters anymore. How old would they be? Maybe 30 or 40? Was it 1987? Oh, maybe, yeah, maybe 50. Yeah, I'm not sure. Um, Okay, one second. So yeah, time for a quick walkthrough of SnapRevise and I reckon we can find a good question to look at as well. So if you log into SnapRevise, which is where we do all of these web classes usually, we just thought it would be really cool to do, yeah, I have no idea if they're real, but we thought it would be really cool to start doing them on YouTube because they've been going so well and we wanted to show them to more people. So, um, yeah, you can see a load more of these on Snap providers along with loads of other cool stuff. So I'm just going to go take a look at my courses. I've got a dashboard in Snap Revise. Um, and I haven't bought psychology yet, but I thought I'd take a look at some point. It looked interesting. Um, I know nothing about psychology. Is anyone doing a level psychology? Um, I kind of wished I did it at the time. So let's take a look at the physics course. Uh, maths, oh, I like maths. I like to stay fresh. Um, so it's quite quite useful to take a look through, for, even for me. It's good to see some resources, who knows? Um, <laughs> no, maths is great. Uh, no, I personally, <laughs> I have Snap Revise uh, from working here. One of the perks of the job. <laughs> Okay, let's take a look at some stuff. Stable and unstable nuclei. That looks perfect for us today. Yeah, let's do that. So here's here's the great thing about Snap Revise. Classic, classic. Ah, I already did this quiz. That's such a shame. Okay, we'll have to pick something else. Let's go for, let's see, beta decay. That's the one. Okay, so it's not unusual in a revision website. Yeah, yeah. So this is great. So in a usual in a usual kind of revision website, um, you might well have quizzes that try and help you see how you're doing. Typically, they'll be after you've done some material. You know how it works. You you do you go through a lesson, and then at the end you have a quiz to see how you did. At the end of the quiz, you then go, okay, cool. I'm like sixty percent of this. Fine. And then you move on to new stuff. And we think that's kind of the wrong way around. You need to do a quiz at the start in particular so that you can be guided and make sure that you only spend your time learning the stuff that's really vital for you personally. So let's have a go at a quick quiz. So, um, and after the quiz is where stuff gets really good, which is most likely to be stable. I don't know, that one looks good, cool. What should we say? Beta plus decay should be making a, uh, a positron, yeah. Okay, uh, let's just say, okay, I meant to get that wrong. Let's get some wrong. Cool. So we have a crack at all of these questions and they're quite good quality questions. Um, they really will actually test your knowledge. Great. So we've got through the end. Um, 
And here's where stuff gets really good. I scored 43%. I got three out of seven correct. Normal stats. I've been told what I know and what I don't know. Um, so this is the stuff that I need to cover. And this is the stuff that I don't really need to cover. I just smash that stuff out of the park. Now we get started and here's where the fun begins. So now I've been taken into Snaprovise's um, course um, for this part for this part of the, G of the A-level course. And here's the great stuff. If you look on the left-hand side here, it slammed me straight into a lesson video, which is very nice of us. But the great news is actually, I don't need to watch this one. I already learned all this stuff. I, I answered the quiz perfectly on anything that was green here. So I already don't, I can already streamline my revision and Snaprovise is telling me exactly which bits I should be looking at. Even inside a video, there's bits here which are highlighted in orange and sometimes bits which are highlighted in green. So I can even stop when it gets to green in a video. Yeah. So the idea is to make sure that you don't spend time learning stuff that you already know. Um, so outside of this, we also have revision guides that we produce. Um, and aside from just normal exam questions, um, and like mark schemes, we've been coming up with our own questions, etc. And we also take exam questions and do walkthrough videos. The idea being is that looking at a mark scheme is one thing. Look at a mark scheme, it wouldn't really help me to figure out how someone would think about answering this question. It would just be like, well, now I know the answer, now I get it, but how would I have figured it out for myself? So the idea of an exam walkthrough video is to take you through how we personally would have a go at answering a question. So here's a question about beta minus decay, and we'll talk about how we would actually go through it ourselves. Um, cool, so, because we think that's the bit that's kind of missing in a standard mark scheme. So I'll just give everyone a look at the plans so you can see how it all works. Um, it says our new isolation kit. Um, we have regular subscriptions, a monthly fee per subject. And our idea was the following. Tutors can cost up to £50 an hour and, and more, in fact. Um, we want to try and take something like that and make it way more accessible, make, a, make a, a service that feels similar to having a tutor, but at a much more accessible cost. So there's three levels. There's the basic level. At the basic level, you have access to some mini revision guides. Um, you have access to all of our videos. So all of these revision videos you can see and you can watch. Um, so in fact, actually, if, if any of you did, did or looked at GCSE physics, you should see my course. Um, I didn't do the A-level physics recorded course here, but I did the GCSE one. Um, uh, we, you also have these exam walkthrough videos uh, where we take you through a particular topic. Um, and the mini revision guides. In the pro section, we give you access to this quiz stuff. So the stuff that tells you how to streamline your learning. Um, this we've, we've called it smart adaptive learning. The idea is to give you your course, not just any course. Um, and finally, we thought, how do we really try and recreate everything we possibly could about a tutor at a more affordable price? So we, we took 50 pounds per Per session for tutoring, and we thought, what can we, what can we stretch that to? Let's try and give more, but for fifty pound a month. So, for example, I'm doing currently, aside from the two web classes here a week, I'm doing another six web classes a week um, inside Snaprovise itself, including drop-in sessions where people can come in with. Uh, particular questions and exam questions that they're not getting on with. Uh, and we can just discuss them together and we go through them kind of like a tutoring session. And I'm doing, well, let's say there's four weeks in a month. I must be doing four times eight, maybe like 24 to 32 sessions um, in a month at the moment, um, all for the price of one tutoring session <laughs> um, in the standard private tutoring setup. So our idea was to try and really scale and improve that model. Um, so you have access to all the usual stuff, plus our web classes. Um, so those are a bit like today. Um, it's the web classes and drop-in together that I do maybe 24, 32 hours of a month. 
uh, drop in there's two drop in sessions a week another four web classes and two youtube sessions good okay so um, as you can see there's an opportunity to start a free trial here and furthermore if anyone wants to uh, sign up today then we have a coupon code that works for the rest of the day. So until midnight tonight, you'll be able to use this code here. Um, not this code, this code for £10 off your first month. Good. So um, I hope uh, I hope that was a useful session today. Thanks very much for sticking around and taking a look. Um, and hopefully see you all soon, either on YouTube or um, on SnapRevise itself. Awesome. Thanks very much, everyone. Gracias, indeed. Yeah, no, thank you very much too. Okay, thanks very much for coming. Um, catch you all later. Bye.